St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hearts of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then, in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated. Join our hearts together in prayer. The Lord be with you. O eternal and loving God, as we've heard the reading of your word, so stir our hearts with your Holy Spirit's abiding presence to grasp your love for us, your good news, in the midst of words that can be painful and hard. Let your word speak to our hearts, your word of grace. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Divorce. We all know that word. We all know someone who is divorced. A parent, a child, a neighbor, a friend. We all know someone who is divorced. And we know that divorce is painful. Divorce is a rupture, a breaking of a relationship. And anytime you have that going on, just the word rupture, breaking, these aren't nice words. These are painful words. Painful words that reflect the shame, the guilt, the questions, all the stuff that goes on when a relationship is severing. And we know this well. But it's not new. It's not new at all. Every generation knows that word. So today we come in Mark to chapter 10, and here's some Pharisees. Remember, the Pharisees are experts in the law. And they hone in. They're very, very astute at trying to understand what is God's desire. They drill down into the law, and they keep drilling. And so they come to Jesus, and it's like, okay, we've been questioning what this guy's been up to. Here's a good test for him. Let's ask him about divorce. What might he answer? How is he going to take and respond? And Jesus says to them, well, what did Moses say? So not just going back 2,000 years, but now into the earlier days of the Old Testament, way back in the time of Moses, what did Moses say? Well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and divorce her. And Jesus says, 
No, that's not quite how it works. Moses wrote that because of the stubbornness, the hard-heartedness of the human heart. You see, the Pharisees wanted to trap Jesus. They wanted to drill down and find a way to get him on the hook so they could discredit him, so that they could push him to the side. You know, that's that drilling down of the law, going into all of the depth of what answers might be, that was digging into the rabbinical teachings, digging into the trends of theology for hundreds and hundreds of years. Where would he take his position? That's how the Ten Commandments ended up being something like 613 rabbinical laws, trying to figure out who's in and acceptable, who's out and needing to be, you know, seen as unclean. Who's in, who's out. Jesus surpasses all of that by taking back all the way and says, here's the problem, guys. It's to look at the intention that God had at the very beginning. The intention of God was for human companionship. It was for that deep-seated need of relationship. God's intent was that folks would come together and walk together in life as companions, as helpmates. Jesus, by doing this, goes back to the real source of problem. It's sin. Divorce comes out of sin. Now, it may feel like at the moment that the Gospel of Mark is throwing a lot of salt on an open wound. The words may sting. And that's when I invite you, remember the intent in the Gospel of Mark. At the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, the author tells us that Jesus has come to bring good news. You know, Jesus was not baiting the Pharisees, seeking to put in guilt and shame, but rather was leading them to receive grace. Jesus came to take away the sins of the world. Jesus came to forgive sin. In the other Gospels we hear, Jesus came that we may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came in the fullness of time speaking God's intention to God's people. Jesus came to speak new life, love, hope, forgiveness that overcomes sin, that overcomes the pain of sin. As I stand before you this morning, I am a descendant of divorce. Somewhere around 1920, my red-haired, feisty grandmother, German grandmother, Schwarztrauber, isn't that a great name? My family in the old, old country, they wanted every bit of ink they could get in a name, apparently, Schwarztrauber. She married a guy that she loved while she was pregnant with my father, my biological grandfather, Silas, hit her. He was a drunk. He was an alcoholic. We put more shame on divorce than we do alcoholism, and alcoholism is a bigger problem. She finally had enough. Tired of being beaten, tired of living as the wife of an alcoholic, she divorced. My mother married a man she loved. And after my brother was born, she discovered him hanging out with other women and running around on her. When she confronted this issue, the man put a gun to her head. My mother was Polish-Lithuanian, strong-willed, thanks be to God. She said no. She called the police. The police allowed her to carry, take away anything that she could carry out of their house. She and my brother left to live with her parents. In both cases in my family, the church told the women, 
you must go back to your abusive husband. Sin does its thing. Sin goes down and simply leaves nothing but pain. Jesus speaks to us this morning a word of hope and peace, a word of forgiveness. And here's how we're going there. The Pharisees came to trap Jesus, but Jesus ends up trapping them. The disciples start asking because they're now confused. And Jesus uses an example of children. People are bringing their little kids to Jesus, and Jesus is welcoming them, and Jesus is putting his hands on to bless them, and his disciples get upset because, you know, Jesus is for adults, apparently. And Jesus says, unless you receive the kingdom of God like a child, you're just not getting it. Here's the thing. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Paul wrote those words for us. We had them in the absolution during our time of confession and forgiveness this morning. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all sin, and Jesus came to forgive sinners. There are many reasons that relationships break, and sometimes relationships break in the healthiest way the most reverent way is to divorce. That sometimes is the path forward, and it hurts. And there's shame, and there's pain. But as Jesus has come to bring us good news, he brings us good news that in him we are a new creation, that in him we have hope, that we can walk forward in grace. Life's messy. For whatever reason, we humans want to put everything in a tight little box and have it all neat. The Pharisees wanted that. Tell us the correct interpretation of Scripture. Put it in a box for us, and we'll just have that and control it. That's not how life is. Life's messy. Divorce happens. Jesus is there with us in the midst of that speaking the word of peace, sometimes challenging us because sometimes we're wrong, but also meeting us there, speaking a word of forgiveness, giving us a path forward. You see, Jesus is inviting throughout his ministry, inviting everyone to walk in the way of grace, to understand God's desire for us is love and inviting us into a path to live into that. Life's not easy. Never has been, never will be. Yet God's there with us. I invite us this morning to hear the good news, that God meets us in our brokenness, that God meets us offering us that forgiveness that we need more than we need anything else. I invite you to ask yourself the question for this week, how will you walk in grace this week? The way of grace is forgiving yourself. The way of grace is forgiving others. The way of grace is seeing that God has new life for us. The way of grace is knowing God's love, which will not let us go. How will you walk in grace this week? Amen.
With the whole church, we join in professing the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you have raised up faithful leaders throughout history. Empower those discerning a call to ministry and all seminarians that they continue to be formed by the gospel and equipped to proclaim your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have established a diverse and beautiful creation. Revive declining species and preserve endangered lands. Cultivate in us a sense of wonder for the world you created. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You desire for us not to be alone and to live in community with one another. Strengthen relationships between nations and peoples that we celebrate and support one human family. We pray for those in this world that overlooked and forgotten amidst their struggles and suffering. Lord, in your mercy. You share in our experiences and struggles. Bless all who live with any physical, mental, or spiritual ailment. We pray for healing and comfort for all who are ill, including Frank, Pat, Norbert, Stacy, Mike, Kendra, Donna, those on our sustaining prayer list, and those we name now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have established and nurtured relationships that extend beyond those gathered here today. Bless our homebound members who can no longer travel to worship with us and remind us of their continued role in this community of faith and our continuing love for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You yoke your people together in partnership for the furthering of your good news, both inwardly and outwardly. We give thanks for all our partners, including Bishops Eaton and Reinhardt, Luther Hill Ministries, Texas Lutheran University, Upbring Lutheran Social Services, Refugee Services of Texas, and our international partners in Peru, the Central African Republic, and the Maasai in Tanzania. Lord, in your mercy. Your prayer. You promise eternal life to all your children. Thank you for the people of faith who have gone before us, including Nancy. Strengthen our trust we have in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. After the prayers of the people, we join in that act of reconciliation amongst one another in community. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share the peace as we are able in this time.
Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, have man Holy, mighty, merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst come. The table is ready. This morning as we commune, you'll come up the main aisle. As you near the baptismal font, you'll extend your hand outward and I will extend mine toward you with a wafer of bread and the words of promise. You'll step to the side that you're seated on, lifting your mask to consume the wafer. 
And then you'll step to where the assistants are and they will proclaim the words of promise as you pick up your individual cup of wine. You'll step to the side consuming that and then you'll find baskets as you return by the side aisle to place that empty cup in. We indeed have the offering plates at the head of the aisle if you've brought your offering with you. Let us join in communion. Thank you. 